Thanks for helping us out. We've got more neighbors to worry about these days with all the new people moving into the area. Hi, I'm Greg Brandy. Just getting ready in case we've got some flooding later this week. A river that collects water from a watershed feeds this bayou. A watershed is land that naturally drains into a river. And heavy rains in that area can cause flooding downriver in our area. That's why the bait shop has been chosen as an emergency rescue station. So many people are moving into this area lately to be near the water or away from the city. As often as this place floods, I hope they know what to expect. Yeah, if they look around, they see that a lot of people have built their homes on stilts. You know, we've been studying ancient Egyptian history, and the yearly flooding there was considered a plus. Egyptians settled in the area because of the rich soil deposited when the Nile overflowed its banks. The rich black mud was perfect for farming. This fertile soil was often referred to as the gift of the Nile. I also know of places in Asia that depend on seasonal floods to fill the rice fields with water. The farmers plan on it, and to miss the floods would be considered a disaster. Well, for us here, flooding is a disaster. Definitely. It can get personal when flooding affects people's homes and workplaces, the towns where they live. Sometimes the impact can change the ecosystem, the environment they've always known. One of the worst floods in America's history was not due to nature sending rain, but was from a reservoir built by humans in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. An earthen dam had been built to create a lake by a hunting lodge. The hunting club did little to repair weaknesses in the dam, and on May 31, 1889, it burst, sending 20 million tons of water down the mountain on Johnstown below. The whole lake emptied in about 35 minutes, and within a few hours, more than 2,200 men, women, and children were dead. 970 were missing. The flood would be the first big test for America's newly founded Red Cross. All across America, people read in newspapers the horrible fates of entire families, locomotives being stacked like toy blocks, and stories of heroes who risked their lives to save children from being swept away by the raging waters. Did you know floods are more common than tornadoes, earthquakes, hailstorms, and volcanic eruptions combined? Holy mackerel! Perhaps the most powerful flood to hit North America took place almost 15,000 years ago, towards the end of the last ice age. A huge 2,000-foot deep glacial lake that covered what is now western Montana gradually broke through a dam of ice, sending a 400-foot wall of flood water westward towards the Pacific Ocean. Traveling over 90 miles per hour, the Missoula floods changed the shape of mountains, ripped up hundreds of feet of soil and rock, and scarred the landscape, creating formations like the channeled scab lands in present-day Washington. Volcanic and glacial sediments were eventually deposited 600 miles away in what is today Oregon's Willamette Valley, creating the area's rich farmland. Even today, you can see boulders dropped by this prehistoric flood throughout the city of Portland. In 1927, a Mississippi River flood would result after heavy winter and spring rains that would change America's attitude about letting homemade levees handle flooding. In the span of several days, seven states would be inundated by floodwaters, about 26,000 square miles of land, including farmlands and residential lands. Hundreds of thousands of people were left homeless. It was that Mississippi River flood of 1927 that inspired our nation's leaders to hand the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the huge job of building the longest system of levees in the world. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a mission to control floods, and that mission was uh, established for the, the lower valley here in the 1928 Flood Control Act and the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project. In 1927, the disastrous flood occurred, and it affected the economy of this entire country such that Congress recognized the importance of flood control in the valley. Following the, the passage of the 28 Act, the Corps came in and, and built a levee system in the lower valley, which consisted of some 1,600 miles of, of levee. A levee is an earthen structure that is used for flood protection of, of adjacent lands. The levees along the 
Mississippi River are designed to protect from what we call a project design flood on, on the Mississippi River. The project design flood is roughly equivalent to about 20% above the 1927 observed flows. However, the flooding is still going to continue. It's going to continue the rain, and the runoff from that rainfall has to have a place to go. So we design the flood control and levee systems to offer a place for the water to go. The levees are set back away from the river such that there's room for the water to flow between the levee and the river system during the major flood events. We have floodways adjacent to the levee systems to, to offer areas for the water to escape into, and many of those floodways are located in areas that were natural diversion points along the river system. And so we work with nature in the best way possible in deciding where to allow the water to go when the heavy rainfalls occur. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are America's experts on flooding, but even their experts admit that sometimes levees aren't enough to prevent flooding. As recently as 1993, a Mississippi River flood would always be remembered as the Great Flood, the size of its devastating impact on nine states in the Midwest. It was a flood that literally changed the address of one of those flood-stricken towns, Valmire, Illinois. Right now, I'm standing in the front yard of what used to be our community school. During the flood of 1993, this area was covered with approximately 14 feet of water. The Mississippi River had started to create problems in early 1993 in areas north of us. The river was rising every day. It was going several inches every day. We had all of the stories coming down from the floods up north that the snow was melting finally, and it was very bad. The river continued to rise during the month of July, and we knew that sooner or later that water would begin to saturate the levee, and the chances of a break occurring were going to be greater as time went on. On the evening of August 1st, we were involved in some sandbagging and levee monitoring activities uh, north of town when the water started to overtop. And by the time we left that area, water was up to our knees. And then sometime during the early morning hours of August 2nd, the levee that was protecting our area finally breached and allowed the floodwaters to come into Valmar. You could stand at the cemetery in town and just listen to the water come in. The weirdest part of the whole situation was you could hear the water roaring through like the cornfields, and you could just hear the corn stalks snapping off as the water was coming down. Normally, our town center was about four miles away from the main channel of the Mississippi River. But after the levee breach, this entire floodplain area was filled with water, a stretch about four miles wide, about 30 miles long. It covered about 60,000 acres of rich fertile farm ground at that time. We pretty much stayed up in the cemetery at the other end of town, and you could look out over the floodplain. I just remember watching the fact that my roof was the only part of our two-story house you could really see very well. Uh, the flood hit at uh, beginning of August, and we did not get back in our home until probably the middle of October. When we did get into our house, you walked in, and you had, we had corn stalks, and I'd say the mud and the silt in our living room was probably knee-deep, and it was just pure stink. It was just terrible. Within about two weeks of the time that the flood occurred, we were able to assess damages and determine that more than 90% of our structures were going to fall into the FEMA substantial damage category, which meant that in order for the people to rebuild in this location, they would have to put their homes on 10 to 12 foot stilts. And that's when we began the idea of trying to relocate the village to a different spot. We were able to find a spot about a mile and a half from the, the prior site of Valmeyer and more importantly, 400 feet higher in elevation. Prior to the flood, our population was right around 900. And now in the new town, since we have rebuilt, our population with the last census was right at 6, 610. The people that have made the move to the new town have definitely moved out of the harm's way of the river. And they know that anytime future flooding occurs, they don't have to worry about that anymore. No one was hurt in this flood. It was very, very hard. But we have a new town now, and things are better. You just have to keep going one day at a time. Studies show that during a flood, just two feet of swift water can carry away an automobile, and six inches can knock you down. 
While the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, is best known for assisting after a declared disaster, they also help communities evaluate flood risk and mitigate disaster. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and they are tasked with uh, coordinating and responding to disasters across this country. For many, many years, the federal government's response to flood disasters was to pay disaster dollars, and it was in the billions and billions of dollars. So in 1968, the National Flood Insurance Program was born. Part of the National Flood Insurance Program is mitigation. That means what can be done to help reduce the damage to property and the loss of life. One of the methods that the federal government uses uh, in floodplain management is the building of dams and levees to hold the water back or release it on a steady basis instead of all at once. This particular dam regulates Buffalo Bayou, one of the watersheds that flows through the city of Houston. One of the ways that people can mitigate their structures is to elevate their homes or their businesses. As you see in the house behind me, that structure has been elevated on what is called a shear wall. The molding on the house is probably the level that FEMA has determined where the base flood is going to hit so that the damage in the house is going to occur not to the living area, but to the garage level. You can also elevate your house on fill. Some communities even go farther than that. Some communities have put it in their local laws that you cannot build in the floodplain. Many people think that if they're not in a high-risk flood zone, they don't have to buy flood insurance. We're finding more and more of our flooding events in the National Flood Insurance Program are occurring outside of the high-risk areas, mainly because of development. As concrete is laid down where there used to be ground that would absorb the water, it changes the way the water runs. Many people think that if they don't buy flood insurance, the federal government's going to come in and assist them in their flooding event. Disaster assistance is available only when a president declares an area a disaster area. Over 90% of the flood events that happen do not receive a federal disaster declaration. So it's important, no matter where you live, to buy flood insurance. Here's a tackle box brain teaser for you. Floods account for what percentage of presidentially declared disasters? A, 30%, B, 45%, C, 75%, or D, 90%. So you've seen, when extreme weather events send flood water down a watershed, the land's natural drainage system, the additional rain can cause rivers to swell, spreading out into their floodplains. But river flooding isn't the only kind. Think of what happens when a storm formed offshore which is water against coastlines or into coastal cities. Flash flooding occurs in the desert southwest, where the land is so dry that when it rains, the land can't absorb the water fast enough, so floodwaters are suddenly sent roaring through canyons or dry creek beds. We're talking in a matter of minutes. And as sprawl becomes more common, so does the potential for urban flooding. Urban flooding occurs because undeveloped land is paved over. Rainwater that normally would be absorbed by the ground runs off flooding local communities. As it travels through the cities and towns, it picks up pollutants, fertilizers and pesticides from lawns, oil from streets and businesses, sewage, and sediment, especially from construction sites. No matter what type of flooding you're talking about, the presence of swift water not only impacts the environment, but also creates risks to humans in the area and sometimes even animals. The year that this happened was definitely an, an El Nino winter where we were getting much more rainfall than usual. All of the creeks were swollen, everything was saturated, everything was primed for problems of this sort to happen. Kachina was one of our regular trail horses. We had just gotten her in 1997 the rescue happened in February of 98, so she was kind of new with us. We had turned her out the Saturday evening to graze on the hillside, and when we came out to feed her in the morning on Sunday, she immediately headed down for the gate where she knew her feed would be, and the trail gave way right underneath her. 
We got called out here for a horse rescue of a horse that had slid down this bank about 60 feet and pinned itself behind a tree on the far side of a creek bed. The problem we had was the more we cut to get this horse free, the more we found. We'd cut branches, we'd clear mud away, there was more branches. We kept working and working and working. We tried hand saws, we tried everything. So we finally get the horse loose and it slides down into the creek and it's rolling over and over in the creek and it's so weak now that it can't stand up. So we had to roll it over and get its legs downstream and it finally came up with just enough energy to basically crawl out on its knees onto the bank with us pushing and pulling and she just laid there for about 15 minutes. When we finally pulled Kachina out of the creek, the vet was there and he administered a drug for a shock and we put blankets on her. And about 15 minutes later, she was able to get up and walk and came back here to the barn. So she had no injuries at all, except for being really tired. One of the important lessons that we learned was that you listen to the firemen. You do what they ask you to do. We wanted to get into the water and try to help rescue. And they kept saying, no, we don't need to be rescuing you guys. You stay out of the water. We're trained. We'll get in the water. We'll take care of this. The fire department never wavered, they never hesitated, they didn't care whether it was a horse or a person. They did everything that they could and that they would do the same thing no matter what the situation was. And the answer to the tackle box brain teaser is D. On average, 90% of all disasters that the president declares are flood related. Flood protection can be more than you might imagine. You'll want to put aside emergency supplies like drinking water, a battery-powered radio, and a flashlight plus extra batteries. Sandbags and plastic sheeting. And the non-electric can opener. Easily forgotten, but very important. Also, check the backflow valves installed in your home sewer tracks to make sure flood waters don't cause sewers to back up into your home. Make sure that every person in your home knows how and when to turn off gas and water. It's also a good idea to move valuable household items upstairs or into the attic. And don't forget to check the basement. And don't forget to tie down or bring indoors floatable outdoor furnishings like patio furniture, garbage cans, and grills. They can bash against your house during a flood and cause significant damage. And never try to ride a bike or drive through a flooded area. Cars don't make very good boats, and you could end up in a very dangerous situation and grab a camera to take pictures of the damage, both house and items in the house, for insurance claims. If you're in an area that floods, check to see if your family's insurance policy will cover the damage. Not all policies do. So it really is a risk to move into an area that has flooded before. But when an area is beautiful or convenient or inexpensive, how do you weigh the advantages against the danger of flooding? Tackle that challenge. You'll see it's not an easy one. Many people are willing to take the risk, and that's why flood preparation is so important. Be careful and stay dry. Let's go check on the neighbors. And grab a camera to take pictures of the damage. Ah, fun. And don't forget to tie down or bring indoors floatable outdoor patio furnishings. furnishings. And don't forget to tie down or bring indoors outdoor floatable furnishings like furnishings. And don't forget to tie down or bring indoors floatable outdoor furnishings like patio furniture. And don't forget to bring indoors or tie down floatable fur patio furniture. That's why the bait shop has been... Uh, oh, no. Visit our Tackle Box website to learn more. <laughs>